This is a video for those of you participating in our education time on Sunday, February 17th, the first Sunday of Lent. I will share with you information related to the texts for the day, and when we gather you will process it with other Christians in the church, connecting God's story to the stories of your own lives. To start, it's important to remember that our story with God begins in a garden. It begins in a beautiful place. It begins in a place where life flourishes, where there's color, where there's vibrancy, where there are creatures living together in harmony. Our story with God begins in a garden. But unfortunately, it does not stay in the garden. The garden space filled with so much life ends up being destroyed. And this ends up creating the wilderness or the wasteland space. This is a picture of the wilderness of Judea, where Jesus went after his baptism to be tested by the devil for 40 days. That's our gospel text for this Sunday, Jesus tempted in this wilderness. And notice, now we don't have the plants, we don't have the grass, we don't have the colors. Apart from scorpions and snakes and bugs, the wilderness is not conducive to the life that God created us to have. And it's precisely this reason that Jesus goes into the wilderness, because by going to the wilderness place, the place where the garden once was, Jesus takes us and begins the journey back to life. To give you a contemporary image, this is a photograph from Afghanistan in the 1960s. You'll notice places to sit, bridges, water, grass. Now here is the same exact spot in 2007. Look what it's become after decades of war. Gone are the trees. Gone is the water. Gone are the people. What once was is not even recognizable, so they even have to label where certain features of a familiar landscape once were. And this gives us the context for how the story of the Bible unfolds. We were made for a garden. That garden became a wasteland, and yet God did not want to leave us there. This is a famous altarpiece called the Altar of Ghent. And you'll notice in the corners there, Adam and Eve, who I'm going to focus in on. Adam and Eve were made for the garden, and yet they had to leave that place, and they have to leave totally unequipped for what is to come. They leave naked. They leave vulnerable. They leave ashamed. And in fact, if you look in the panels above Adam and the panels above Eve, you will see some of what they'll be subjected to, namely the jealousy and violence and finally the death of one of their own sons by the hands of the other. So we might say that the creature Adam, at least by biblical terms, is male and female, and that when Jesus comes into that Judean wilderness that I showed you, he comes as the second Adam. And this is such an important feature of the story. Jesus comes as the second Adam. Now this imagery of first Adam and second Adam is very important for the way the Bible understands our story with God. The first Adam, and by that may we mean the man and the woman together, the first Adam is disobedient. The first Adam does not listen to God, and by that disobedience, death enters the world. The garden becomes a wasteland. The second Adam, which is Jesus, has to be obedient for God's plans to come true, and by him life will come back into the world. The first Adam is disobedient, wasteland. The second Adam is obedient, and that wasteland is returned to a garden. It is no mistake that in John's Gospel, Jesus is buried near a garden, and when Mary Magdalene sees him, she confuses him or mistakes him for a gardener. And we might say in a very real way, Jesus is the gardener. Now, if in fact the first Adam was tempted by the devil in the garden, now the second Adam is tempted in that wasteland. We know what happens when the environment is degraded, so a place with trees and clean water and so on becomes a waste. So compare the two settings, the first Adam tempted in the garden, the second Adam tempted in the wasteland. And we might say that the devil tempts the second Adam with the same game that he used for the first. And so what are the three temptations that Jesus faces? The first one has to do with eating, 
and you'll remember the man and the woman were tempted by eating in the garden. The second has to do with worship, and you'll recall that Adam and Eve were tempted away from directing their hearts towards God and worship. And then the third has to do with faith. And in fact, the devil says to the first Adam, the man and the woman, did God really say that? Or did God say something else? The devil twists belief so that it turns from life to death, and it's very subtle. So for you who will be coming to the class, I want you to think about these three areas too, as it relates to the appetites we have, as it relates to self-love, and as it relates to obedience. Does God get to set the agenda, or do we? Now, if you want to, you can assign one of the three Lenten disciplines to each of these areas too. As it relates to appetites, we have the Lenten discipline of fasting. As it relates to self-love, we have the Lenten discipline of alms, meaning that you take the needs of the neighbor above your own. So we could say alms or works of mercy. And for faith, we have prayer. For obedience, we have prayer. Jesus, shape me according to the image of your resurrected body. So on Sunday, when you come and we talk about the second Adam being tempted in the wasteland, we're going to talk about how the appetite was the temptation, or how the appetite was tempted, how Jesus was tempted to self-love, and how Jesus was tempted to disobedience. As it relates to the first temptation, where Jesus is going to turn stones into bread, the idea is... Does Jesus' hunger, does Jesus' appetite, is that what Jesus follows? Is Jesus a slave of his hunger? A slave of his hunger. This is a question for you to ask. You have appetites. You have desires. Are you free to choose, or are you a slave to your appetites? Jesus freely says, one does not live by bread alone. He can choose not to eat. He can choose not to be directed by his hunger. He freely chooses. And part of what God wants to do is God wants to free you so that you have a similar freedom. As it relates to self-love and worship, the devil is essentially saying to Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. You can be worshipped without the cross without the suffering, without the hardship, Jesus. Apart from the Father's mission, I'll figure out a way for you to be worshipped. But of course, you have to worship me. As you go through Lent, where are you directing your heart? Where are you directing your affections? Are they toward you? So that rather than having love go out to God, it kind of just turns back on yourself? This is where we make room for the neighbor and the needs of the neighbor as a kind of antidote to self-love. And then finally, that third temptation is he says, go up on top of the temple. Test God. I bet God's angels would catch you if you threw yourself off the building. And what the devil is doing is he's telling Jesus, give God new terms of faith. Be disobedient. Rather than saying, God, I'm going to live in the boundaries that you have created. And this is kind of the good life here. We're going to put the good life Go out here and see what God does. Go out here and see what God does. Go out here and see what God does. And what Jesus reminds the devil is God has already given the clear parameters. So God does not need to be tested. God has been very clear in what God expects. And so rather than being disobedient and rather than trying to give God the terms of faith, Jesus simply follows. Now, when it comes to obedience, which is not a popular word, are you content to follow? This is a question you need to ask yourself. Am I content to follow, or am I constantly telling God the terms by which I will live my life with and for him? That essentially takes care of the story of the temptation of Jesus, at least for what we're going to talk about on Sunday. But there's another reading I want to refer you to, which is Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. This is the Old Testament reading for Sunday. And what you'll notice is the people are coming to worship. They're coming to make a gift, which is their offering. So they're bringing an offering to worship. And that offering is rooted in a story. 
This is what I want you to notice. So if you have a chance, read Deuteronomy 26 before you come on Sunday, 1 through 11. Because when they bring their offering, they are rooted in a story of what God has done for them. This is so important. Now their story is different perhaps than the story we would be rooted in as Christians in terms of the main narrative. But when you come to worship, is your life framed in the story of what God has done for you in Jesus? This is the question. Is your life rooted in the story of what God has done? And what you'll read in Deuteronomy is they say, let's go back to Abraham. Our father was a wandering Aramean. Then we were slaves in Egypt. That wasn't so hot. But God had bigger plans for us. And so God set us free. They went to the wilderness, wilderness place. And finally, they went to the promised land. Land is so important in the Old Testament because it signifies the tangible, real effect of God's faithfulness to us. So they retell the story, and then God says, make an offering to me that is first fruit. Sometimes you'll hear Christians talk about this as first fruit giving. God says, I gave you the land, I gave you freedom, and now make a gift back to me as a reminder that you know you've received everything as a gift. The temptation is that the offering we make to God comes from our leftovers. Well, I guess there's enough left to give to God. Now, let me be clear. Some of you are probably thinking I'm talking about money, and I am. But even more than that, we're talking about your talents, your passions, where you invest your time, where you volunteer, how you spend your free time, all of this stuff. What do you offer back to God that represents the best of what you have and not what's left over? This concept of first fruits is so important because for someone to have a healthy, mature life of faith, they have to give what's of the best and what's not left over. No leftovers, we might say. What do we want to say in summary? In summary, if you recall, we were made for the garden. We were made for paradise, for life to flourish, and that garden became a wasteland. The story that we're rooted in is God did not leave us in this wasteland which finally leads us to death, but rather God comes amongst us. God has solidarity with us in Jesus, and God leads us back from the wasteland, from the cross, finally to the garden, back to paradise. God leads us back to paradise. Jesus is tempted according to his appetites, and you will be tempted according to your appetites. Jesus is a tempted according to self-love, you will be tempted according to self-love. Jesus is tempted according to faith and disobedience, you will be tempted according to faith and disobedience. Don't assume that anything that happened to Jesus will not happen to you. But Jesus has made a way for us to follow, a way through the wilderness, a way through the thicket of temptation, and finally he leads us to the way of life. I look forward to talking with you more on Sunday. If you have any questions, please email me, and we'll see you then.